and welcome to Curator on the Loose Live. Uh, my name is Emily Simmons and I am a program supervisor in the education department here at the Museum of Flight. And today I'm with Matthew Burchett, our senior curator, and we're going to ask you some questions. Oh boy. Oh yeah, it's going to be good. And for all of you viewing out there, please drop your questions in the, the chat because we're going to be taking them live as they come up. You ready for this? <sighs> Do I have to answer truthfully? Can I make stuff up? No one will know otherwise. Ooh, that takes the pressure off. Yeah, so All right. do what you gotta do. Okay, Here we Excellent. go. All right, first question, first question. Why and how did you become a curator? Why and how? Mm -hmm. Let's see. Um, okay. <laughs> We're There's a lot of backstory here, so <laughs> strap in, people. Um, as a kid, I was always collecting things. Of course. <laughs> like, and it just drove my mom nuts. Like, I would come home from grade school with those little tiny milk boxes, and I would, like, put them on my shelf in these rows. And, of course, with the milk still in them, kind of, it mm -hmm. started to stink, and so my mom would have to... And oh. she started taking them out, <laughs> and I never knew that my collection was not growing. You didn't notice. Yeah, no. Not so, a very good curator. As no, a I am not. <laughs> <laughs> so um, later on, I, I actually really had no desire to. I, I went to to museums as a kid. I was constantly dragging my parents to the Texas um, State Natural History Museum in Austin okay. to see the big T Rex skull, and they had all these cool dioramas, and I always wanted to go there. And thank God, my parents took me all the time. They were really cool about that. Um, but once I got into school, I really didn't know what I wanted to do. Um, always loved history. And so when I, when I started thinking about college, I was like, I want to be an OBGYN because I'm fascinated about how a person can go from like teeny tiny to like full, you know. Full human. So I fully decided that I was going to be a doctor and I was looking at the catalog at Baylor University and I went, whoa, aphids, chemistry, <laughs> bio, whoa, done. So that's how far that went. <laughs> I had about five majors before mm -hmm. I settled on interior design, awesome. which has nothing to do with museums. <laughs> I mean, um, a little bit, right? We it, have well, to it works design out, actually. our interior here. Yeah, it works out. So I did it because I didn't want, a, it didn't require a math or a language. And I was, I'm not good at math, and I still don't understand why not having a math and interior design makes sense, because you do a lot of measuring and whatnot. Right. But. Right. <laughs> so I, I, I got out, and then I was like, well, why didn't I do anything with history? So I went back to school and was gonna do a master's in history, not mm -hmm. knowing what the heck I was gonna do with it. And I'm going through the catalog again, and there's museum studies. And mm -hmm. I was like, whoa, that's kinda cool. That's like hands-on history, that's even better. Oh yeah. So I ended up going back to school for another four years, Ooh. taking <laughs> every class they had in museum, <gasps> museum studies, and right as I was about to graduate again, um, I ended up dovetailing right into their um, graduate program. Mm -hmm. So I was one of the first three students in their graduate program, and so I have a master's in museum administration. All right. And I ended up working at a museum exhibit design firm. So the museum and the interior design all meshed together for about five years mm -hmm. in Houston, Texas. And it has worked out really, really well because from there, I went to a museum in Denver mm -hmm. called Wings Over the Rockies and I did most of their exhibit work there. Wow. Um, even though I was listed as curator, it was really exhibit designer. <laughs> and then I came here and now I'm not doing really exhibit design much at all, mm. um, but I'm doing a lot more of the curatorial stuff. So it's, it's all worked out really well. So when did your love of aviation and space come into this? I have always been an aviation geek. I don't want to be a pilot. I don't need another hobby, mm -hmm. um, especially one as expensive as that. But I've <laughs> always loved aviation history, specifically World War II aviation okay. history. Um, and so 
I knew about Wings Over the Rockies. Mm -hmm. I actually lived in Seattle at one point in the early 90s, and I tried to get a job here, and they weren't hiring. So I became a volunteer oh. for about a month and then got the job in Houston. Okay. Um, so never even got out on the floor. But, you know, while I was in Houston, I was finishing up my master's thesis and was, was researching and found out about Wings Over the Rockies in Denver mm -hmm. and knew I wanted to be in Colorado. So just kind of took it upon myself to, to get to know those people and that worked out really well. Awesome. Um, so just kind of, it, it wasn't so much about aviation history is just kind of where I wanted to be. Mm -hmm. And as it turns out, Denver and aviation were checking two boxes, two really large boxes. So off I went. Awesome. Well, I have a question from one of our live viewers. Ooh, okay. Uh, Shauna wants to know, what's the most underrated airplane here in the museum? Ooh, 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 ooh. Underrated. <laughs> oh, man. You know what? I am going to say the Taylor Aero car. That thing is that. so cool. I love it so and much. It kills me that it never, no pun intended, took off. Mm -hmm. Because we could all be flying Taylor Aero cars about now. We could be flying like Taylor Tesla Aero cars or something. I think that is the coolest little plain car gizmo we have mm -hmm. in the entire museum. I mean, we would have to have three different licenses in order to operate That is it. true. <laughs> well, would we have to have three? I think so. You have to have a, a trailer license, a driver's license, and a, a pilot's license, right? I don't think you have to have a tra you would have to have a trailer. I don't think it's a license. Oh, so you'd okay, you okay, definitely okay. have to pilot and drive. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you. You're welcome. So related to that, uh, what's your favorite plane? Ooh, doesn't that, have to be here at the museum. Well, that kind of, here at the museum, it depends on the day. Um, <laughs> you know, I kind of vacillate around, mm -hmm. you know, on what, what I like. One of my favorites is right over here, the F-8 Crusader. Um, I love the XF-8U-1, which is the prototype Crusader. There's just something about that plane. It just looks fast you know, when it's just sitting there. Mm -hmm. But then on other days, I'm walking around and I just love the Sopwith triplane. Oh, that, that is, one is really a cool. really cool World War One plane. Awesome. So I have two people uh, who are some live viewers um, who are asking more about the F-14 or the F-18. So first question, do you want to, slash are you going to do a Curator on the Loose about the F-14 or the F-18? We are um, on both. So I've got some buddies that are F-8 or F-14 pilots. Wow. Um, so that will help. That'll give us somebody to interview. There's casual buddies. Yeah, just casual buddies <laughs> that are F-14 drivers. Um, you know, you got to keep that kind of stuff in your back pocket because you mm -hmm. never know when you're going to need it. Um, F-18, we're probably going to end up doing something up at Whidbey Island uh -huh. with uh, VAQ-134. I can't guarantee that, but that's my, my hope. Mm -hmm. We've filmed with them before. I've filmed with them before. I still know some people in the squadron. Okay. And they fly the EF-18, which is the electronic version of the uh, wow. F-14 or F-18, which is known as the Growler. And okay. there were a couple of them here, actually, for... Seafair. So if you were looking out oh, the window, that's the two gray That's plane. what was out there. That is what was out there. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you. So there's a very specific question. Uh, is the F-14 at the museum actually from VF-84? That is a good question, which I cannot answer off the top of my head. But thank you for your question. But I can look that up <laughs> and I will, I will find out and we will post that in the chat. So what I want to know now, we're clearly in our great gallery here. There are yes. planes hanging from the ceiling. Uh, what happens to the aircraft that are hanging on the ceiling if there's an earthquake? Ooh, that's also, a, that's a scary question. That's a question that we don't want to think about, but. Be prepared for it. We are prepared for. So we didn't just go up there and decide, hey, we're going to hang a bunch of airplanes and, you know, start. <laughs> crimping together some wires and mm -hmm. stuff. No, 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 no. 
We had a um, engineering firm come in and they have done all the rigging for us. And if anybody out there is an engineer, you know that you guys love to be safe, which is a good thing. A really so good So all of these are stressed to like 10 times above what their actual weight limit is. So depending upon the earthquake, you know, they're gonna sway a little bit, but they're mm -hmm. not gonna fall. Um, in fact, talking to one of the um, engineers and architects about this building, they were like, you know what? The building is gonna fall before the planes are. Then we've got a much then bigger we issue. Have a big problem. We have a much yes. bigger issue. So thank you for answering that. It is kind of a scary question. It is, but, but you know what? It is something that you need to talk about. And we do have, I mean, we've got a, a security department here and we have drills and all sorts mm -hmm. of stuff. So we are fully prepared to, to keep us and our visitors and our artifacts safe. Awesome. That's really good to hear. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> so <laughs> I really want to know, and someone else asked this, but give it to us. What's the next big thing you want to add to our collection here? That's a great question. Um, so we're kind of an odd museum in that we're not actively seeking aircraft. We don't even have a list of <laughs> aircraft that we want. And there are a couple reasons for that. Um, we kind of don't need to. Mm. We get offers of aircraft almost every month. It's literally every month. Really? Sometimes every week we'll get something. Um, if, if we get to the point where we're gonna do an exhibit, because a lot of things can be exhibit driven, you know, say we're gonna improve our Vietnam exhibit, and we say, you know what, what we really need to tell this story is either an O2 or an OV10 or something like that, we'll go out and find one. Now, luckily, we've already got an O2 up at our second location, mm -hmm. and we could come down and hang that or put it on the floor, and that would tell the, the FAC story in mm. Vietnam. FAC is forward air controller. Thank you, I didn't know. You're welcome. <laughs> um, but we don't really go out and just say, you know, I think we need X. People are coming to us. Boeing comes to us. Individuals come to us. The military services come to us and say, hey, we've got a, an X, do you want it? Um, a couple of months ago, we were, we were offered an F-15, and we turned them down wow. because it wasn't the right F-15. Mm. Um, it wasn't the time. You know, there's a lot to say about timing. Where is it going to go? If it's big enough like an F-15, something might have to actually leave the museum or oh. be put in storage. Mm -hmm. So there are a lot of things that we have to think about before we, we just go, yes, because that is what I would typically like to say is, yes, we will take it because, you know, I like planes. <laughs> but I have to like, I have to put a lock on that. Uh -huh. Otherwise it would just look like a, a yard sale in here with planes everywhere, which I think would be okay, but. <laughs> Sounds yeah. kind of like a hard job. It can be, yeah, because you have to say no a lot of the time. And it's like, but it's so cool. Yeah. Well, Itterbon asks, what's your favorite museum other than the Museum of Flight? Oof. Um, okay, for air and space museums, I really like the National Museum of the United States Air Force in Dayton. Oh, okay. It's huge. <laughs> okay. Just, and there is some really cool stuff in there. In one gallery alone, mm -hmm. they have a B-52, a B-36, a, let's see, a B-1, and a B-58. And these are all really big bombers. And they're in one building. It's just nuts how big this, this museum is. Everything's really Whoa. well done. Um, it's kind of the one-stop shop. Mm -hmm for American aviation. Okay. Now, if you want to see stuff that's not ours, you got to check out the Udvarhazy Center, which is part of the Smithsonian Air and Space Museum. Oh, okay. It's their kind of satellite location. And there's some amazing stuff in there. But I think number one is going to be Dayton for me. Okay, good to know. So for all of you out there who are aviation lovers, maybe start planning a trip to Dayton. Make the trip to Dayton. 
Um, I also want to remind all viewers, please put some questions in the chat, uh, drop them in, and we'll ask them for you right here. Uh, I do have some more questions from live viewers. Right, hit it. So Richard wants to know, will the museum ever consider getting into the historic flight experience market? In other words, will the museum ever fly our planes? No. <laughs> That's an easy one. We're just not going to do that. That's not. We're not that kind of museum. No. There are other museums that, out there that are totally that that kind of museum, and that's fine. That's what they've decided to build their uh, business model on. That's not what we are. We are just a 100% static museum. Now that doesn't mean that we don't have some flying aircraft. That O2 yeah. I was talking about does fly. We've got a T6 Texan that flies. We don't do revenue flights. There's all sorts of issues with the FAA and insurance and all that kind of stuff and we would rather preserve our aircraft as they were mm. instead of run the risk of, of something happening. Yeah, we don't want to ruin our collection. Yeah, exactly. Awesome. So another live question. Uh, Dan wants to know, what is the most surprising thing museum staff have found in an airplane while preparing it for display? You know, I can't, I have only been here since 2019, so I have not been a part of any of the, the older restorations. So unfortunately, I can't answer that question. Um, I would love to, because now I want to know. Yeah. So maybe I can find out and we'll put that in the chat later too. That's a good question. So similar question, and again, you've been here for a shorter amount of time, but do you, have you heard of any of the most surprising things that our collection staff have found in any of the boxes in the archives? That's I know a, we, we got some a, weird stuff yeah, in there. Yeah, that's a little bit closer to home. <laughs> um, you know what? I'm going to answer this from my past. Okay. Um, the weirdest thing I ever found in a collection when I was working for Wings Over the Rockies is we had got a collection of World War II memorabilia from a gentleman. His, he had passed away and his family was donating the stuff. And so, you know, we had accepted it and everything. We're going through these boxes and buried in the bottom are a, are a set of track shoes oh. from like the 1980s. And we're like, why what? is this even in here? <laughs> this is like random stuff. Were they used? Oh yeah, they, somebody had been running in them. We don't know how they got in the box. <laughs> did anyone try them on? No, <laughs> no. They did not get accessioned either. Oh, you know, okay. They were not part of the collection. Dang. <laughs> so I think you've already answered this. Uh, we've talked about your favorite plane a little bit, but I just want to check. Uh, Gilakwahu wants to know what's your favorite aircraft on display here. So we did talk earlier about Yeah, the so it's either the F8 or the, the stop with triplane, depending upon mm -hmm. the day. But I also have a soft spot for the Huey. Mm. Um, <clears throat> I've been really lucky to meet a lot of Vietnam helicopter pilots. <clears throat> Pardon me. And there is just something about those guys. They are so humble. Um, and the ones that I have talked to have been very free in telling stories about oh. what they went through. Um, and just, it's just amazing. I love those guys so much. So I have a very soft spot for the Huey and what it represents. Mm -hmm. um, if there's another one in here that I really love, um, it's going to be the B-47. Okay. That's kind of a random one, you know, B-47 is not on the top of a lot of people's <laughs> lists of, that's a cool plane, but it is a cool plane. It's just so sleek looking. Okay. Um, and just the fact that they were able to strap on Jado bottles, they weren't strapped on, they were actually inside the plane. And I look this up when you get back to your computer. All right. <laughs> and just type in Google B-47 Jado takeoff. Oh my gosh, that's the coolest thing ever. And then the fact that here you've got a, a jet bomber that was doing what they called toss bombing. Mm -hmm. And so they would fly along and they would pull up and then they would release their nuclear bomb, which would then travel straight up and then it would go down as toss or loft bombing. And then of course the plane would turn over and flip and then start hauling ass the other direction. Yeah. 
Go out and take a look at the B-47 and go, that thing's doing like a fighter maneuver. All Just right. love is it. Is that out love it, in love our it, aviation pavilion? That is pavilion? out in our aviation pavilion. All right. What corner? It is right behind the B-29. Okay. Thank you. All right. So, again, live. Uh, Damien wants to know, what's your favorite aviation movie from the 1980s through today? <laughs> um, ooh. Oh, man, that is a good one. Now I got to really think about this. It's, it's going to sound cheesy, but it's probably Top Gun. But a very specific part of the movie that first, like, what is it, three to five minutes where they're just showing all the activity on the carrier deck, that I used to put in on my VHS, <laughs> play that and like crank the stereo so you just hear that rumble in the music and everything and that'd be like, okay, done. Was that your like, get ready for the day? Yeah, that, that's right. <laughs> yeah, go to college. <clears throat> We're gonna get it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> so, um, a question we had before, Kevin W., who worked on the SR-71 for four years, wants to know if we have pictures of the air, or uh, the aft, sorry, aft cockpit of the crashed SR-71 number 977. That is a great question, which I cannot answer right now, because I don't know. I'll just be honest. <laughs> but... It does open up another line of question in that we have an amazing photograph mm -hmm. archives. So if you're interested, look up the Museum of Flight archives. We have its own page and you can go in there and ask questions and we can research because we'd love to find out if we've got information on that. Mm -hmm. We do have a vast oh collection of images. It is nuts. I was just over there this morning for a behind the scenes tour. It's crazy. It was lovely. It is crazy. There's so much stuff. I know. Oh my goodness. So Dan wants to know, what's the most challenging thing to display, fixed wing or rotorcraft and why? You know, I don't think there's any, honestly, much difference. Um, mm. For hanging, helicopters are way simple because you just hook onto the Jesus nut up there on the rotor mast and you just <laughs> hang the thing. I mean, the, the helicopters are designed to hang from that one spot anyway. I mean, you know, the, the body is attached to the blades and the blades are attached to the mast and all of that. So, when, so those are really simple. In fact, if you look right there at the Coast Guard, yeah. you know, it's all hanging from the, the rotor mast. Just you know? one part. No big deal. But then if you look back here with the fixed wing aircraft, mm. you got to have multiple suspension points or it's really dead simple to just put them on the ground. No yeah, big deal. That would be the easiest yeah. thing, huh? So we're talking about our collection. You mentioned earlier how one, we don't want to fly them because we're keeping them safe and how they were right. and everything like that. So John H wants to know, how often do we wash the aircraft outside? Is it difficult? Do they also get oh. a wax? What do we do with That them? is a great question. So once a year, we have what is known as the Detail Mafia come in. And the Detail <laughs> Mafia, yeah, seriously, are a bunch of guys who take their own time and bring their own supplies to come in here and detail our aircraft out in the aviation pavilion. Wow. And they take about a week mm -hmm. and they come in and each year they'll do a specific number of aircraft. Like this year wow. they did the B-29. They always do Air Force One. We didn't need to do Concorde because we just repainted it. Right. Um, we're just repainting the 737 just as an aside. <laughs> so these guys come in and spend an entire week taking care of our planes out in the mm -hmm. pavilion. And that's why they look so great is because these are professional car detailers and they're just up there wow. polishing away and it's just, it's amazing. Can and it's literally all on their own dime. Wow. So they're volunteers. They are volunteers. We'll hook them up with uh, hotel rooms and we feed them and okay. all that kind of stuff. But yeah, and it's a big deal. I mean, people yeah. vie to get a, a, a place on the Detail Mafia to do this. So you can't just 
be an average person and volunteer to do this? Nope. Nope. All right. Good to know. So all of you out there who want to touch some of our aircraft, <laughs> get in line. <laughs> get in line. <laughs> So Steve, who is a member, and thank you for your membership, and thank you, whoever it might be a member out there watching today. Yeah, seriously, um, thank you guys. What would Matthew, what would you name your own plane, and why? Um, it kind of depends on the plane. And I, you know what? I just honestly cannot answer that question. I have no idea. It, no? Yeah. It would, it would just have to come to me, I think. Do you think it'd be like a human name, a goofy name, a pun? <sighs> it, it, knowing me, it would either be a pun or a goofy name. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense for you. <laughs> <laughs> well, it those does. are all of our questions. So, awesome. Thank you so much, Matthew. Thank no, you for thank sharing you. your knowledge, your history, your background. Thank you for sitting here with me because not many people will do that. Well, I loved it. Okay, good. I mean, we're friends. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you to the audience for joining us, giving your questions. Uh, you can catch episodes of Curator on the Loose on Facebook or YouTube. Um, how many and which ones would you recommend? I would recommend them all, um, <laughs> but one of my favorites is where we go visit the ARFs, which are the Aviation Rescue Firefighters here at King County International Airport. I got to do some really cool stuff in that episode, so check it out. And if you didn't know, and if you are of a certain age, we're also on TikTok now. I know, it's kind of ridiculous, but it's really fun. It's really fun. It is really fun. <laughs> well, thank you, everyone. We hope you have a great week, and tune in for some of the other stuff we're doing. <laughs> you never know what's going to happen. Never. <laughs> should we start a choir? We should start a two-person choir. Uh... <laughs> This might have not been a good idea. <laughs>